Good morning, learners, parents, old unionites. I trust that you are as well as you can be under lockdown level three regulations and that you've somehow managed to maintain a degree of normality in your life, in your lives despite these regulations. It's certainly been a very different sort of December holiday this year, certainly from our own family's perspective where we've not been able to see very much of our family at all and we've, we've largely been confined to our own home. I'm mindful at this time of those families in our community who have been devastated by the loss of loved ones during this pandemic. And I, I've been praying for God's peace, love and comfort for you all. And I extend the sincerest condolences on behalf of the school to you all. Many of our school families have suffered the most terrible losses. Today should have been the start of the school year, but the start has been delayed to the 15th of February. This is a tremendous pity, and we can expect res revised term dates to be provided to us in due course, and we will adjust our planning once again. I always look forward to the first day of the school year, when the retur learners return after their lengthy holiday, and the new grade fives arrive, new learners who have joined the school sit in the hall with terribly nervous and uncertain faces. I enjoy it because this is what school is all about. The coming together of a community, of a group of people with a special bond, in this case Union High School. I love to see how the children have changed, how they've grown taller, they've grown in confidence, and how happy they are to see each other again. The school just seems to get into gear and motion automatically and smoothly as everyone plays their part and gets the job done. This year will be different because there will be no assembly in the hall and at this stage many of our learners will be attending school on alternate days so the whole body of learners will not be together at any one time. I also believe that this year is going to be tough with the can cancellation of much anticipated events such as the grade 8 orientation camp, new parents tea, the founders weekend and all of the fun activities associated with this. It will also be tough because many people in our community have been through a difficult time, be it through the loss of a loved one, financial pressure, the loss of work, or simply that the lockdown has stolen their joy and zest for life. In September of last year, after my father passed away, I had to travel to East London to assist my brother and sister in packing up our family home. This was a strange experience, going through all of one's parents' belongings, having to make decisions about who was given what and what to dispose of. What I most wanted to find amongst my parents' things, and particularly my mother's things, was information related to the family genealogy, old photographs or anything that would give me information about my family's history or origins. Out of the blue, I found some writing of my mother's and a diary of my grandmother, which I quickly took possession of. The first piece of writing was something that my mother had written as a sort of tribute to her own mother, and I read it with such happiness at having found it, and of course with interest. The reason I share it with you now is that it tells a story that began during the Spanish flu, a pandemic similar to the one we now endure and that perhaps there are lessons of hope contained in it. My grandmother's mother died of the Spanish flu when my gran was only five years old, leaving behind her a grief-stricken husband and three little daughters. She was buried in East London with the body of her baby son. It seems that the flu took its greatest toll on those who were burying children at that time in the early 1900s. How sad! that her little girls would never really remember her, and that her grandchildren would not know the joy of a grandmother's love and care. My grandmother's father took his little daughters to live with his brother, who was a station master at Tarkestat. This was after the family had taken them in initially, but having decided as a family to move to Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, they had given the lasses back to their father. My grandmother, whose name was Rita, was a middle child. How lost and lonely the three little ones must have been, left behind by their father, who was unable to cope. 
Eventually, my grandmother's father fetched his children to bring them to Cape Town where he was stationed. During the train journey, he left the carriage to refresh himself and before he had returned, the train resumed its journey. Not knowing that their father could walk from carriage to carriage, the girl set about wailing in great terror and sadness. Along came a lady who inquired why they were crying so hard. We've just got our father back, they said, and now he's gone again. At that he returned and got to telling the kind lady about his plight. What are you going to do with them, she asked. God alone knows, he replied. Well, one thing led to another, and what had started as a casual meeting developed in time into a romance, and they were soon married. Before they were married, the stepmother arranged for my grandmother and her sisters to be placed in a children's home in Cape Town. It must have been an awful place, for my grandmother had a horror of being in any kind of home until the day she died. Once she married my grandmother's father, the stepmom made a home for them all. It was a very frugal home. My grandmother remembered sitting around the table on paraffin boxes. According to her, stepmother looked after them well. Undoubtedly, she was the saviour of that little family, but a saviour not of a gentle or kindly nature. She was a strict disciplinarian who, once she had meted out her punishment, was not about to allow leniency. No, she would adhere strictly to the laid out punishment, which could last for weeks. From the very beginning, my grandmother had not accepted her readily as mother, but clung much to her father, whom she adored. So perhaps the stepmother found it difficult too to soften towards Rita, my grandmother. For all her moral uprightness, it seems that the stepmother was devoid of a truly motherly heart. Until the birth of her own daughter, on whom she lavished her newfound maternal love. Although life was tough, she never even tried to buy or make a doll for each of the little girls. Then the younger of the three, Ada, died suddenly, and Rita and her sister, Linda, clung to each other for support. These were hard times. Out of such a background of deprivation in so many ways, my grandmother emerged as a young lady of great beauty of body and soul. Scarred as she must have been in the mind and heart, nothing of this could be seen in her appearance. She was a perfect lady of perfect taste. Stepmother was certainly not the source. My grandmother's father was very strict about bodily appearance, demanding that his daughters presented themselves well in public. But from deep within my grandmother, there came this sure and certain knowledge and awareness of all that is right and proper and that all that is good and true. It is as if she took to heart the scripture that says, Whatever is lovely, whatever is beautiful, think on these things. My own mother said that she, had w she wished that she had known her real grandmother. Surely she too must have been a lovely lady. My mother said, that she herself had a fairy tale childhood. Her mother, my grandmother Rita, must have decided that her children would not know about the dark and difficult things in life, that they would have everything that she had lacked, and so they were protected and brought up as though they lived in a part of heaven. They were never spoiled, but they had everything that their hearts really desired. Their mom would find an excuse to buy them something they had seen and liked. It would be a gift for Easter or because they had achieved well at school, she would find a reason. They had dolls in all shapes and sizes, and they reveled in their family of little people and all these beautiful toys. My mother said that it was strange that she never found it a shock to come face to face with all the hardships out in the world. She did not remember being surprised to find the world so tough. Her mother had taught her to be compassionate, so she was aware of those who were struggling. Coming from my grandmother's background of a limited education because she had been forced to go to work because of financial necessity in the home, one wonders, even now, how she knew to offer her children the best that was available. She must have been an astute listener and quick to learn about the best for her children. She read to them from the finest literature available at the time. She really loved the poetry of A. A. Milne and Beatrix Potter 
that she truly brought to life. And so they came to appreciate good literature from an early age. If my grandmother had a fault, according to my mother, it was that, it was that she had always been too shy. She was great in company and could really hold her own, but it took a toll on her and afterwards she was really tired. She also never fully realized what a great lady she was. And perhaps this was what kept her humble and so more delightful. She had a wonderful marriage to my grandfather, which lasted over 50 years, until he succumbed to Alzheimer's disease. These were surely the hardest years of all, as she slowly and pain painfully had to part with him. Shortly after my grandfather died, she lost a leg to diabetes, and then the other as well and was in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Still, nothing crushed her indomitable spirit. She lived in the family home on her own, with only the assistance of a daily nurse, almost till her death. What a legacy of excellence she passed on to her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. In the second book of writing that I found in my mother's house, my grandmother's diary, there's an entry for each day, her reason for that day, for which she had been grateful. What is most striking to me is the pleasure that she took in the simple things in life, the garden that she loved and cared for, the birds that came to her window, a little girl and her grandmother walking by and admiring her garden, or a visit by an old friend who had come to tea. I'm so grateful to have had these amazing, strong, gracious women in my life when I was growing up, and to have learned so much from them about the world and how we should live in it. My grandmother in particular is an example to me of how to conduct oneself despite the difficulties that life has brought us, no matter what life threw at her. Her mother and br brother and sister's deaths, being placed in an orphanage and losing both of her legs, she persevered and looked for the best in life and brightened other people's days. All of us have a parent or grandparent of whom we can say the same thing. Someone who raised you to be the best that you can be and who treated other people with kindness, empathy and compassion no matter the circumstances. I encourage you all to be mindful during these enormously challenging times and to be kind, to look after yourselves and your families and to help others where you can. Shall we pray together? Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of education in every form. As teachers, learners and parents prepare to start a new year, may confidence be their foundation. May the grace of your Holy Spirit be their guide and may hope be their compass, compass towards a bright future. Keep them safe, dear Lord, Pray that they would have eyes to see the needs of those around them, and a heart to love well and to be kind. May they face each day courageously, knowing that whatever comes their way, they do not have to face it alone. Journey with them, gracious Lord. Hold them with your righteous right hand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We look so forward to school reopening soon and to welcoming your children back to school and to helping them become the best that they can be. God bless you all.